Well, uh, hi everybody and welcome to the UK Stroke Assembly. We are live, as we said, in East Midlands and we're live worldwide on Facebook. So make sure everyone gives them a big wave and makes lots of noise. Uh, today's all about being interactive, guys. So remember, this is all about you and you look fantastic. And if you've got anything to say, just say it. Um, we're joined, as we said, by the Stroke community on Facebook and we're also joined by the amazing Megan Gillia, uh, MBE, who is going to tell me lots about her story and also teach me how to cycle because I can't. Probably the only person in the room who can't do it, but I know nothing about it. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about my history. I have uh, been a supporter for the Stroke Association for over 20 years. I know I don't look it. Uh, but uh, my mum died when I was 23 of a stroke in front of me, and I made it my mission to try and educate young people that can stroke and affect everybody. And I didn't really know how to do it. I wasn't the kind of person to run in a banana costume and do the marathon, but I was somebody who wanted to do something ultra glamorous. So I started to sort of doorstop different celebrities and try and get them to support what I was doing for stroke and trying to educate people about it. And it suddenly started to work and lots of different celebrities joined me and fashion brands started to listen to what I was saying. So I did lots of different collaborations with brands like Boo who and I saw it first and I've created this new campaign which is called which is Style for Stroke and this is a, a campaign which actually Joni Scott here who is uh, here is one of the people who told me to do the Survivor t-shirt so thanks to her for that and obviously um, we've got a gorgeous daughter here as well who's modeling it too um, and what we want to do is use fashion as a way of creating a conversation and getting people to uh, talk about stroke raise money, raise awareness, and hopefully change the world one fashionable step at a time. Um, and you can get your T-shirts. It's on represent.com forward slash um, shop <laughs> forward slash style for stroke. Uh, have a look online. We've got some of the T-shirts outside. And the half of the money goes to the Stroke Association and half of it goes to Interact Stroke, which is a fantastic charity. And we've already seen somebody who's wonderful from there, Nire, who's uh, been up here talking and, and, and judging you guys. Um, but anyway, enough about me, because it's always about me. Uh, it's time to talk about Megan, who's absolutely brilliant and giving her time up to talk about her wonderful career. Give her a massive round of applause, please. Everybody, <laughs> Megan Gillia. <laughs> And look at those shoes, they deserve a round of applause as well. Sparkles. They're fabulous, sparkly, wonderful. Listen, first of all, thank you so much for coming today. It's so great to see you. It's great for you to be around everybody here as well. And obviously your story is so inspiring. And I think everybody in this room really wants to hear a lot about it. Uh, we'll start off before you had your stroke uh, to tell us a little bit about how you, what your life was like because you were pretty active, weren't you, doing lots of things. Yeah, so as you know, I had a stroke, but prior to that, I class myself as Megan the First. Um, and as Megan the First, I was a bit of a jack of all trades. I was, let me think, I was a swimming instructor, I was a lifeguard, I was a duty manager for a leisure centre. I dabbed, I put my hand in with the police force. I did kennel management. I did, what else? Oh, cyclist. <laughs> Just uh, that the little list thing. is kind of endless, really, in that respect. Um, I was always on the go, I was always active, very physical from the day I was born. Um, compared to my family, I was the only sporty person, but only taking part. I was never a spectator of sport. I wanted to be up there, I wanted to be in it, I wanted just to be playing and having fun. And it's all about the fun aspect. Um, what else about me? I, I'm just Megan. I'm, I'm a human being. We're all human beings, we're all individuals. And I was, yeah, that's that. What I do do is I live by saying I'm not what happened to me I'm what I choose to become and that is a massive part mm. of my life and a part of my recovery um, and as we go into detail I'll probably be able to just dig that's into that more. a little bit more and tell you how I use that saying. Because that's really inspiring I think to to everybody the way that you sort of inspire other people but also people like myself as well. So in 2013 you were hit with a stroke and that obviously changed everything uh, what, take us through, sort of talk us through what sort of started, how did you feel, what were your emotions and, and what happened? Well, approximately 10 days prior to my stroke, I actually received news that my nan had just passed away. And it was basically multiple, multiple strokes, it was blood vessels bursting the brain as far as I know. Um, and I was at work and I, I fainted a couple of times and I thought, that's a bit unusual for me. The only time I've ever actually fainted, it's not even fainted, it's knocked out, is in rugby. I took on a massive tackle and broke so my So you're a rugby player as well, yeah. as everything else. Oh, yeah, that as well. <laughs> and um, 
I thought, this isn't quite right. And I woke up one morning and my whole eye was bloodshot. There were, I was having real stiff pain in my neck, which I thought would maybe I'd just got a bit of whiplash from doing some sport or something. Um, and I just knew that something wasn't right. I had really bad headaches. But the eye was the bit that was the trigger, the fact that my whole eye was red and I hadn't actually done anything physical in the last couple of days. So I was like, I'm not sure about this. Um, and I held it off for a couple of days, actually, and the headaches were getting worse. And I thought, actually, you know what? After work today, I'm just going to nip into A&E and &E and um, just have a chat. And I walked into A&E, and you, around you, you know, you always see the people with the physical injuries that you can see. So there's children with bloody noses and people with broken arms and wailing and howling. And I walked in, and I thought, they're just going to think I'm a hypochondriac and send me home. <laughs> and I went in, I said, look, this is the situation. This is what's happened. I've got massive headache. Um, I don't know what to do. It may just be a migraine, but could you just have a look at it for me? So I went through the triage process, and then I got called in by a doctor, and he had a look at me. He was like, I think you're okay. What we're going to do is we're going to monitor you for a couple of hours. If the headaches persist, we're just going to give you some painkillers, and we're probably going to send you home with cluster headaches. So a form of migraine, basically, a bit of tension. And I thought that was what was going to happen, to be fair. But while I was waiting... What was really quite weird, actually, is I was actually, because all the corridors were actually lined with people, it was quite a busy day for some reason. They obviously knew I was coming in. Um, they actually put me into an operating theatre line on a bed, or at least it looked like an operating theatre. I'm not sure whether it really was. But there was the big lights above you, and I was lying on a bed. Um, and it was dark because I was really photosensitive. And it just so happened that this um, female surgeon walked past, and she, she came in, so whether or not she was eyeing the bed up for, for the next surgery or something, I don't know. And she said, look, what's your symptoms? What are you doing here? Um, I'm going to pop away and I'll be back in a minute. So she popped away um, and she came back and she said, look, I've asked for some doctors to take a little bit more of a look because your symptoms don't match with your age and I just want to make sure that you're okay. So I was like, okay then. And I generally thought I was okay. I generally thought it was just going to be headaches. I was going to be sent home on my way and I'll get over it. So they did a lumbar puncture. Um, no, they didn't. Tell a lie, they didn't do that first. They did a CT scan. Now, CT scan came back clear. And they said, right, we're definitely going to send you home with cluster headaches. We're OK. And then another doctor came by, and they were doing these hourly checkups, uh, asking me on my pain score, 1 to 10, all the usuals. And they said, look, we just want to do a lumbar puncture just to make sure. So for, I would imagine most people in this room have probably had a lumbar puncture or know what it is. But for anyone that doesn't, you basically lie in fetal position. They get a nice long nail. Nail. Not a nail. <laughs> needle. They That's stick the medieval it into version. <laughs> <laughs> they stick it into your back and they take a little bit of fluid. And in that fluid, there was blood. And that blood indicated that there was something not quite right up here. So from there, I went in for a dyed CT scan. The dyed CT scan was the most surreal feeling in the world because I went red hot and I literally felt like I'd saturated myself. Urinate everywhere. I got out. I was absolutely fine. Yeah. But honestly, I thought I was going to come out and it'd be everywhere. Um, so I had that. And in, in this course of time, it didn't happen over a day. This was a four, around about a four-day period, I do believe, this happened. And all of a sudden, I was on a, on a, in a ward with a lot of other people, um, more severe than me, definitely making more of a racket than me. I just was making the most of sleeping, to be fair. Um, and I got told one bit of information. Whatever you do, I want you not to go to the toilet. There is no pushing allowed. I was like, okay then. That made no sense to me. But it came, became clear because I had this um, doctor come up to me, suited and booted, glasses, tie. And he came up and he said, look, we didn't want to tell you straight away because we wanted to make sure we had the right um, measures in place so you didn't panic. But basically, you're having what's called, you, or what you've got is a subarachnoid brain hemorrhage. And I basically had an aneurysm in my head and it had actually burst and was bleeding within my brain, on one of the main arteries. And I generally thought I was going to be fine. I, I think it was just a denial process, a shock, actually being told something like that. And I was told, and they said, look, you've got two options. We haven't got a neuro, neurosurgeon here at the hospital. I was taken to A&E Warwick Hospital. Um, but you can either be, there isn't a neurologist in Coventry, so you can either be flown to Cambridge or you can be jetted up the motorway, blues and twos, to Birmingham Queen Elizabeth. I chose Birmingham Queen Elizabeth primarily for the fact that I was gutted that if I went in a helicopter, I wouldn't actually be able to see out and have a look at the view. And I wasn't having that. No, I wasn't having that. 
So we got to Bowen Queen and Elizabeth, and I was due for an operation, and the doctor came in and gave me my chances of survival and this, that, and the other. Gives you all the statistics to cover their backsides, basically, stop them getting sued to high heaven. Um, and they said, look, we're going to go undertake a coiling. So they go up through the groin, they go up through the heart into the head, and they release tiny little light spirals, almost like I, how I describe it, little worms. And they basically go in there and they just seal it off to so stop the bleed and allow it just to continue as normal. But during that um, surgery, it failed and they had to wake me up to sign paperwork because I had no next to kin near me, I had no, one, no family members, and I actually have got the paperwork because somehow I ended up with all of my medical records, must have five finger discounted at some point throughout there, and I've signed my life away, basically for them to operate, and they basically opened me up with a knife and fork, stapled me back together, and put me in it, back into a bed. I was in ICU for three weeks, um, and... That was really surreal. I was, I had an armoured pipe and they tried to remove it, but apparently, obviously I wasn't aware of this, but my lungs kept collapsing. So they kept the pipe inside, the armoured pipe inside, rather than uh, changing it to a standard pipe. I don't know the technical words of it. I just know it has. What's an armoured pipe? Sorry. Not, it's just a really strong pipe so that it allows your lungs to feel. Yes, yeah, so it goes okay. into your mouth through, helps you breathe. Um, and I could hear people around me and I'd drift in and out. And I do remember drifting in and out of consciousness because I remember seeing people sitting up and I have another person in another bed next to me that was obviously in a far worse condition but had to be clear his lungs. So they'd be sitting manually, they'd be putting him into like a hoisted chair, allowing him to clean his lungs and then putting him back down and back into his coma. So was, there was a lot of people around me and I was kind of aware of little things happening around me, but I was also aware of the bits that weren't quite right. And I could hear people conversations and some of the conversations were about me, some were about other people, um, but I couldn't speak. And the one thing I do remember is that I heard the doctors o o um, speaking, saying, look, we don't know how much this has affected her voice. Now, as you can tell, I can speak, and I love to speak, <laughs> and I'm very articulate when I speak, and I'm very grateful that I have my voice. Um, but when I first woke up, I couldn't speak. And it took me a long time. And I know there's a hell of a lot of people out here that, and probably within this room that suffer massively with their, their voice and being able to verbalise things and being able to explain things and show how they feel. So I'm very grateful for where I am at. Um, but what did they did, um, did affect was my right side. So I've got right side hemiplegia, which is a weakness on the right side. Um, as you can see, I can use it. But this comes and goes with fatigue levels, with um, seizures, with emotional distress. So my body literally, it's like a coping mechanism. It shuts off and suddenly I lose my right side and can't use it. Um, I have drop foot, so my right foot doesn't move at all. And I, my right arm can hold a pen, but the sentences are ridiculous. They last for about three <laughs> words and then I get tired. Yeah. It's probably boredom, really. I'm just like lazy. But, um, it's good, though, when you do your signatures for your fans, your autographs. Oh, they're all individual. <laughs> all, all different. All unique. Yeah, all unique. Um, and the process was, yeah, so it was three weeks in ICU. And from there, they transferred me to a stroke ward. I ended up on 24-7 bed watch because I kept trying to do things I wasn't allowed to do. <laughs> I was being treated like a child. <laughs> I was getting out of the bed with one side. I tried shaving my legs and ripped, took the whole of the front of my shin off. Oh. Didn't even feel it. Tried to deny it. I, in fact, when they spoke to me, I was like, I didn't do that. <laughs> I didn't do that. And yeah, I, I kind of turned into a bit of a child and I think it was because I was told I wasn't allowed to do things. And it was probably a bit of my recovery as well. And I'm sure that some of the things I'm telling you is how I see it, but not how other people see it. But it's how I believe it went. Um, I, I prefer to think about the funny stories than the, than the real struggles. But obviously, in hospital, there were some real down days when I was, suddenly, when I was coming to realise the realisation of what happened to me and the people it affected around me. Um, yeah, and, and not being able to do the simplest of tasks. You suddenly realise the things you can't do, like tying your shoelace for yourself, pulling up your own knickers, going to the toilet unaided. Who, who wants someone else in the room with you while you go to the toilet? I was on 24-7 because they didn't trust me. I wouldn't pick up a razor blade and <laughs> shave myself. It was just, yeah, ridiculous. But uh, I, I, I made them earn their money, basically. That's how I like to see it. Anyway, they got sick and tired of me. And they shipped me off to an intensive rehab unit in, uh, I think it's called Mosley Hall in Birmingham. 
and they were getting sick and tired of me there as well, to be fair. <laughs> I, do you know what? I couldn't, I couldn't walk when I entered there. I could walk when I left, just about with support. But all of my main recovery happened at home. So you and discharged I, yourself, didn't you? I self-discharged. And when did you do that? I did that four weeks after. So I had my operation on the 4th of February, and by the 26th of March, I was at home. And why was that? Were you frustrated or you just knew you could do it yourself? I was frustrated. I think the big thing was is that I didn't feel like I was being listened to. I felt like I was being held back. I wanted to do. You know, you know how I was saying that in Megan the First, I was always doing. That was me all over again. <laughs> I was trying to do stuff. I was trying to get it better. I heard, had heard rumours that, you know what, if you don't get it back within the first few months, then the chance of you getting it back are, are slim. Yeah. So I was like, I'm getting this back. You know, I was 27 years old and I wanted an independent life. I've always been independent. I left home at 16, never to look back, and I didn't want to go back. And I wasn't going to. So I stayed at home, and I remember my first day at home when I self-discharged, I suddenly realised how different I was. In hospital, I was one of the quickest um, recovery... Um, that's not even the right word, is it, really? I suppose patients, whatever they want to call me, I'm Megan. I was just one, a bit like a competition, really. I was always the first to try and achieve. There we go. And I was pushing myself all the time. And I was one of, the, um, one of the strongest patients there, basically. And I just wanted to be me. I wanted to be able to do the things I used to be able to do, um, not to realise that actually I couldn't. And when I got home, I remember the first day, I just sat in a corner and I was rocking my hand in my head. No, my hands in my head. No, my head in my hands. Get it right. <laughs> and... I was crying my eyes out and it was like, oh no, what have I done? You know, I had, I had people around me that understood me. Not, yes, I had nurses and you had the physiotherapists and some of them were brilliant and some of them were harsh and some of them you could tell just didn't really want to be there. But they all had a job to play. But for me, my security was the other patients, the other survivors, the other people that were going through similar situations. They understood me, they related. They knew what I was going through in their own way. And all of a sudden, I didn't have that network. And I was by myself in a farm, isolated, um, and didn't know what to do with myself. And I didn't know what to do. I really didn't. And one day, it just clicked. I was like, you know what? I've got to, I've got to get up. I've got to start moving. I've got to start trying things. Even though each time I try something, I'm failing, at some point, it will click. I did, couldn't use my hands at this time, so I was learning to tie my shoelaces with one hand and I was using my elbow, like literally my body just on it. I'd wake up and my shoulder dislocated because it, I couldn't feel it and wasn't aware of it and I was relocating it. I did have dislocating shoulders beforehand, to be fair. So I was, I was kind of aware of how to do that. Um, and did you have friends and family around you to help you or were you really no, quite on your own? No, so I went... About four months after my stroke, I was diagnosed with epilepsy. I had night seizures, which were full-on... Uh, convulsions, pee in the bed basically, biting my tongue, blood everywhere. And then I have partial complex um, seizures, so very much staring into space, um, clucking like a chicken, uh, not really aware of it. Sometimes it's literally just out, can't move and can, is aware of everything around me, but couldn't do anything. And when I got diagnosed with epilepsy, I really struggled. Um, and I ended up at a friend's house in Cambridge, but how I ended up there was quite um, extraordinary really. I went into a barn and there was an old bike and I tied my hand to the handlebar and I tied my foot to the pedal oh and I God. actually tried to cycle there. <laughs> I started off at 11 in the morning and I got there around 2, 3 the following morning. I don't know how I didn't wow. have a seizure, but I got there. And it was around, I calculated it, around 120 miles I had ridden. And when I got there, my whole body gave up. And it must have been a survival mode. My head just said, it knew it needed to do something, it did it, and then it gave up. And I was on her sofa for three weeks, and I was like, I don't know what to do. I haven't got a home to go to. I haven't got a life. What do I do? I'm feeling sorry for myself. So all of a sudden, I was put into this turmoil of, actually, I need to ask for help. I need to swallow my pride, and I need to realise that at the moment, I need help, but one day I'll be able to do it for myself again. And her mum, Karen, her name was, she had popped round and she said, look, Megan, should we go out for a little drink? She obviously knew I was struggling. And she gave me the kick up the backside I needed. She was a great woman 
always smiling. And she gave me a little mission. She said, Megan, don't listen to what other people say you can't do. Find something and be the best you can be. I want to give you a mission. I want you to find a sport and be the best you can be in it for you, not for anyone else. And I listened to that. And the reason I listened to it was because at the time, Karen had terminal cancer. She didn't have long left, but she was still carrying on life. She was still giving me support. She was making, you know, she was seeing her family. She was seeing her friends. She was trying to travel where she could. And I know deep down she was having some real dark days. And she knew that she didn't have long to live, whereas I'd been given that chance. You know, I'd survived the operation. And it was about time I sorted myself out. And... It suddenly made me realise my friend Hannah and what she must be going through, having to, having to struggle through, knowing that her, what her mum was going through. And Karen did pass away. About three months after I, I left, left Hannah's, Karen passed away. But she was my first dedication, or one of my dedications in my rides. And I used her to push me on in cycling and to re reignite that, that passion to be Megan, find out who I am. And who I am today is Megan the Second. I've got elements of Megan the first, and anyone that survives a stroke, you know, it changes you. And not even just strokes, you know, it could be cancer, it could be absolutely anything. It could be that you've lost a loved one, in absolutely anything. When something traumatic happens to you, a life experience, you change. Sometimes it has to go down before it goes up, and it's a real struggle, but you find your way. And sometimes it takes someone to wake you up and make you realise what you've got in life rather than what you haven't got. So Karen said that to you. Yeah. And she made, inspired you. Massively. And why did you choose cycling? Well, I didn't choose cycling to start off with. I tried running, <laughs> but I had to go into a wheelchair. <laughs> so they started Lovely. me off on wheelchair racing. Okay. okay, so I don't have the coordination. As you can see, my right hand does not go as fast as my <laughs> left hand. So we went from that, and we're like, okay, that's failing. I had an eight-year-old pass, and I was like, I'm not having this. I am not losing to an eight-year-old. And then no. an 80-year-old, and you're yeah. like, no, no, no. No, 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 forget <laughs> that. So I thought, I'm going to actually try running. So what do I need to do, coach? What do I do? So I've got my crutches, and I'm trying to run. Okay, I face plant. And then I thought, stuff the crutches. Let's just try and see what happens with my leg. Bad idea, bad idea. I literally skidded across the floor. So we decided running was definitely not for me. <laughs> if you had to put me on a treadmill now, I would fly off the back. I can't run. Um, so... I suddenly had this brainwave. Oh, I cycled all the way to Hannah's. Why did I not start with that to begin with? And I contacted British Cycling directly. I don't know how I did that, to be fair, because I don't really remember how it came about like that, because I wasn't very good with modern technology. I'm not very good with it now. I've kind of lost all that ability to change from one thing to another. So once I get used to something, that's it. I can't, can't change. I can change, but it takes a long time and a lot of man hours and a lot of sleep hours to get there. And... Yeah, so I contacted British Cycling and the cycling took off. And as you can tell, I, did, I became a, a gold medalist, the first gold medalist, in fact, of Rio 2016. But I think what surprises people is it wasn't the gold medal that um, made 2016 for me. It wasn't about winning the gold medal. Yes, I got a gold medal and I was Tarsa's favourite to win. But the moment you put me on podium, I shrink away. So... All my races, I did for other individuals that had suffered at the hands of stroke or suffered from some, something that was life debilitating for them and also for the family members around them and the support network because what people, a lot of people forget is that the support network is just as precious and is, it's a ripple effect. That person in the middle, something happens to them and then suddenly it spirals out of control and everyone around them is affected. My fiancé, Tony, she was with me after the stroke met her actually after I won the gold medal. But um, the, I watch on a day-to-day -day basis now how it impacts her in little ways. You know, she's worried that I'm going to have another stroke or whether I'm going to have a seizure whilst out on the bike. I still go and do it because I'm stubborn as and I'm not going to let anyone stop me. But the impact is, is massive. And they, they fight on for you and they be strong for you. But ultimately, at some point, it affects them deep down on a, on a deeper level. And... Yeah, it's, the support network is, is massive, is vital. I've gone off track, haven't I? Where were we going? Well, you can go anywhere, because oh, I just yes. love listening to everything you say. 
I think we all do. You're amazing. You're so inspiring. I think, you know, what you're talking about is really interesting because it is, it is about the whole impact. I remember when my mum died. She died in front of me and my brother of a stroke. We didn't know what they were. And then we had to then deal with a father who was our father figure who had crumbled. And we suddenly had to build a whole new family. Mm. And it is about that. That whole ripple effect causes so much for everybody. So I think what you're saying is really important and very inspiring to think, actually, think about the individual, but also think everybody around you needs that help as well, that support. So the Stroke Association helped you right at the beginning, didn't they, with yes, your bike? What, what did. happened there? So as part of my suck in my pride, um, I went to, I'd say I went to, I didn't, um, two lovely ladies came knocking at my door, so I got uh, given an emergency accommodation. So I was put into a, a hotel, and then from there they found me um, supported living, so I had a little flat of my own. Um, and all of a sudden I felt like, you know what, actually I'm turning into my family, I'm becoming this council house, living off the state, not paying my way. And I was feeling really bad, sorry for myself about that, and feeling really, oh, I don't know how to give back and how to make it better, and how to not become like my family. I love my family, don't get me wrong, but I don't want to be like them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> hands up if anyone else has got a family like that. Oh, there's, there's, a, there's a few of us. We're there's doing a, a Mexican wave here, I think, with that. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, yeah, and uh, two ladies came to the door, Marilyn and Eve they were, and they're from the Citizen Advice Bureau. And they saw me living in this flat, and basically I had no money, had nothing to, nothing to my name, but I really wanted to do my cycling. So British Cycling had seen me, saw I had some talent, um, and, and supported, so provided me with a, like a, a basic road bike. Um, but I couldn't really ride it. I had no real balance. I was like, how am I going to get through this? They see me on, a, on like a, a static bike, basically, but I can't actually ride a bike. So um, they came along and they're like, you've got nothing. I had no sofa, no bed. I was sleeping on the kitchen worktop at the time. And I'm, I'm, I'm quite happy to speak about it because actually... I've come so far from then, and at the time, it just shows what, what can happen and s some of the things go people go through behind closed doors and don't talk about, but actually, it's a, massive, it's a massive thing, and so many people are unaware of what happens and what happens behind closed doors because you get someone as proud as me, I'm not going to tell anyone what's going on uh, at the time, but I realised that someone had to pull me out of that and make me realise that I needed that help. So these lovely ladies, who are now my friends, um, and I'm proud to call them my friends, um, put me in touch with the Stroke Association and said, look, they do grants. Uh, we'll help you fill in the application because I couldn't write at all at the time and I didn't really know how to go about it and we'll see what we can do for you. And, we, and it was amazing because basically they provided me with a small grant which gave me the equipment to get on a bike and try and ride it. So I got a turbo, so you can lock the bike into the turbo and it doesn't go anywhere, so I can't fall off the bike. I can practice unclipping and clipping back in. And they gave me rollers, and rollers is basically like a treadmill for a bike, but it's powered by your legs and you have to balance. So there was a lot of kissing the wall, kissing the floor, <laughs> kissing everything but the bike saddle. <laughs> but that gave me a real chance um, to start really working on myself behind closed doors, building up my skills for cycling. And I knew that in the long run, Marilyn had said, look, you can always give back. So if with, with Citizens Vice Bureau, I went and did like a little film wheel for them of all the things that the Stroke Association had done. And in turn, that was raising awareness. Um, with the Stroke Association, I come and do events like this because you know what, it's so close to my heart and you meet, you meet real human beings, real people, real emotions that you can relate to, and vice versa. And it's, it's just humbling. And I, people say that I'm inspirational, but every single person in this room is inspirational in their own little way, to someone, to everyone. You know, it depends on the person, but everyone is inspired by someone. And I know that by doing these events and being here with human beings that have been through similar situations to myself, and even if they're not similar, we can relate. And, you know, it, it's, it's a whole friendship group. It makes you feel like you belong. And I love that about it. I love the fact it's giving back. And in return, you know, I've, I've earned, you know, by getting that grant, I've just, I've returned the favour. And it's just become an amazing relationship. That's amazing. Give her a big round of applause. It is, it's so amazing. We want to hear more, though. We want to hear more about Rio. Because obviously, you know, that was a, a really 
important thing to get from, okay, you're there and you've got your rollers. The only rollers I know is ones you put in your hair. But the ones that you were on are very different. Um, but you were on the rollers and then suddenly you're on the road to Rio. How did that happen? How did you get that far? So cycling was the biggest part of my rehabilitation, I think, because I didn't only use it for my physical recovery and to get my right side moving. I actually used it for my mental well-being. Um, one of the big things was my mental health. Um, it took a massive blow, and everyone in life will at some point have suffered with depression. Even if they say, I've never suffered with it, guaranteed, if they haven't, they will at some point. Even if it's situational, it's just for a short period because of uh, a situation that they can't control. But it was a really quick process. I applied to be to the talent ID in around October 2013, so very quickly after my stroke. I went along to a talent ID day within a month. By February, March 2014, I was accepted onto the squad. And then by September 2014, sorry, numbers, um, I was basically put onto the talent ladder um, and on podium. And it just came naturally, but I think it was because I didn't have a care in the world. I had nothing left to lose. I had lost myself, Megan the First, and I had to rebuild myself. When you lose memories and you lose parts of your body, not obviously, literally, I, I've got all of my body intact. It just doesn't work sometimes. You have, to, you have to build a new past because what I could do before, I couldn't do now. And... It was about trying new things. It was about experience in life. It was about thinking, actually, I can't do that. And if I keep referring back to what I can't do, it's dwelling on the negatives. Mm. So I started referring to what I can do and focusing on what I could do or what I could potentially do and just went for it. And every butt I saw in front of me, I raced for. I made sure I caught up with them. <laughs> and I had nothing left to lose. It's just like, it, was, it just took over my life. It became everything. I'd lost everything and suddenly cycling became everything. And then through that, I found myself, I began to grow in confidence. I began to accept who I was because it's about acceptance. If you don't accept who you are, you are you're almost creating a false image. You're not really truly happy in yourself. And you have to, it takes a while. You know, I was, I had confabulations after my stroke and I don't know whether anyone knows what that means, but confabulation is basically parts of my brain have been affected. There's blank spaces and in turn, false memories have been put in. So a bit like um, memories from movies, probably. I have no idea what they were, but I just know they're fake memories. But it took a long time to work out what were fake because if you rely on people around you, it's their memories. It's not yours. But there were things that were definitely true. Mm -hmm. So for instance, I woke up and thought I was a vegetarian. I am not a vegetarian. <laughs> apparently, I used to eat meat like nothing on earth because he's a meat eater in the world, apparently. So I eat meat and I need meat within reason for my sport to help me progress and help my muscle regrowth and et cetera, et cetera. But if I had my way, I'd now be a vegetarian. Um, I also <laughs> woke up with three brothers and three sisters. I have one brother, three sisters. <laughs> Is it three sisters? Yes. Two of my brothers were fake. Uh, Harry and Alfie can. Crazy. Harry and Alfie aren't real, but in my head they are as clear as day. I know that one is blonde-haired, curly locks. He's got checkered shirt and jeans. I know that one is sporting and dark-haired, short, and I can describe it down to T. All the hobbies they have, all their likes and dislikes, and all of a sudden I realised they weren't real and they weren't there by my bedside, and I had to mourn them as well. And it must seem really surreal and very unusual for for someone looking in that can't imagine that. My mum could not understand that at all. But to me, it was so real. And they are, are probably more real than my real brother and sisters. Sorry, brother and sisters. <laughs> but it's all these little things you have to come to terms with and adapt and change and, and realise. And you learn about yourself and it's things that you never knew existed and the determination and the grit and yeah, the ups and the downs and how you deal with them and how best to deal with them and what works for you and what doesn't and actually to listen to your body. And that's what made you so determined to obviously get to Rio and yeah. really drive you. And then when you're actually just about to set off on potentially a winning round, how do you, what were your emotions? 
or were you just determined to make sure that there was no butts in front of you and no eight-year-olds or 80-year-olds <laughs> either? No. I, do you know what? For me, it wasn't about the winning. I don't know. Maybe it was. It must have been. It must have been. It must have been. But it was just about doing it for me. It was about being the best I could be, doing it for all the people around me that supported me. So the Stroke Association with the grant, you know, they put their faith in the fact that actually this little dot is no one really, but to them I was someone and that I deserved a chance. And they heard the story and they thought, you know what, she deserves that chance, so let's give her a chance. And for, you know, those, those people as well watching, the fans back home, they are what make the Paralympics real. They're the ones that make the Olympics real. They are the ones that support you. But it's also the impact it can have on the people back home. So, and I dedicated every ride to someone that had suffered at the hands of a stroke. Um, so Karen obviously wasn't a stroke, it was terminal cancer, but I dedicated a ride to her. Um, but for, the, for my gold medal performance, I dedicated to a little lad called Rowan, not Rowan, that's his surname, Alistair Rowan. And he was 10 years old at the time and he had a um, hemorrhage just like myself at school. And he was literally had it about four weeks before I went out to Rio. So he was in the very early stages. His mum and dad were frantic. His, his family around him were obviously, besides himself, didn't know how to support him best. He was obviously in himself lost because he's a little lad, didn't know how to understand and interpret those emotions and those feelings and the pain he was going through. And for me, that race was all about raising that awareness and giving him that little bit of light on that day and his family some, a different way of looking at it rather than thinking, you know what, what happens if this happens again? What about, what's the outcome in four weeks, ten, eight weeks, ten weeks, a year? What can we do now for him? Um, and it made a massive impact. I got off the bike after I obviously won gold and I was dying. Um, obviously not literally, I, but I did feel like I was dying. Um, falling all over the place, could barely hold myself up. But when I had gathered myself, um, I was taken through the media zone and I spoke to Channel 4 and ITV and all the other news channels and the big thing for me it wasn't the fact that I won the gold medal they asked me about it but for me it was all about getting that story out there and I had the photo of the little lab I used Brilliant. and I sat it in front of the bike while I was warming up and that was my focus because I could let myself down and kind of get on with it but to let other people down that have been through those and that a little lad as well got his whole life ahead of him it meant more to me that he he was there cheering me on up behind the screen and getting something out of it and for his family to think, you know what, my son feels happy. And that was, that was it for me. And when I won gold, you know what, yeah, it was amazing. But, you know, I got on the podium. I don't know the national anthem. <laughs> I, had I don't my, think anybody does. I no, had I'm my joking. American <laughs> rival, my American <laughs> rival, and, oh, who was the third? A loser, yeah, yeah a exactly. Loser. Bless. Um, <laughs> but whoever it was, they, they knew the words. I, couldn't have, I didn't have a clue, so there's me just mumbling along, <laughs> pretending I knew what I was Love doing, it. going from one for camera to the next camera. And it didn't hit me, really, the gold medal at all. I didn't really realise what I'd achieved. It, was, it wouldn't be until a good few months later that I actually realised what I'd achieved. Well, it was amazing what you achieved. And I think also what's really interesting too is I think with regards to Paralympics and being seen on TV, in the last few years, it's become much more prevalent. More people are watching it. They watch the Olympics and then they watch the Paralympics and it feels like they're all coming together. And people are seeing what amazing things you can achieve yeah. and what amazing records, which is fantastic. And then not only get the gold, then you get an MBE. Oh, How did that feel? That's hilarious. How did that come? Did, it come oh, like, did somebody come like dressed up? No, in the no, streets. no, no, not, big that, not that amazing. <laughs> so I received a letter. Uh, I received a letter saying that I was going to receive an MBE and that you've got to keep it all, all um, hush hush, as such. It's all embargoed and everything. You can't say anything. If you say anything, that's it. It's like death. You know, you're going to die. <laughs> a no, it's a no <laughs> BE. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And um, yeah, I received it. And I was like, what on earth is one of those? I don't really know. I've got a brain injury. I don't remember anything nowadays. Um, and I looked at the letter, and it was all very, very posh, and uh, it, was, it was amazing. It, and it was, it was, it was, um, it was great. In fact, the day, the day before I received my MBA, I was actually at a stroke. Oh, what was? I was at an event for the Stroke Association. I know I was. The oh, the Ritz. That's it. Yes, because I got, I got a posh suite. Love that. Oh yes. Oh, the wife to be loved it. <laughs> it felt like royalty. 
Yeah, it was amazing actually, we had a magic table. It kind of wasn't there <laughs> and then suddenly there was a massive table full of food. I wasn't allowed to eat any of it because you know, I'm an athlete and all. But, and a vegetarian, um, a Yeah, yeah, and a veg <laughs> vegetarian. And um, that was amazing and to meet some amazing people. But when I went to receive my MBA, do you know, the only, my real memory from there, other than the fact that all the dust on one of the, I saw a curtain and it was full of dust. I was like, oh my God, do the cleaners actually clean around here? <laughs> Sorry, Queenie. Sorry, Queenie. Um, <laughs> uh, they said, when you, when you meet the Queen, you've got to um, address her as your Royal Highness. Well, I said hi. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, yeah. there's a high in highness, so you're yeah, fine. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what I thought. <laughs> but my, my crowning moment of glory in front of everyone is I shouted bogeys at the top of my voice. I did a Dick and Dom moment. <laughs> so for anyone that doesn't know Dick and Dom, I don't know when it was. It was some kind of years ago. Um, two guys used to say bogeys and they're quiet and they got louder and louder, louder and louder. I didn't go for quiet. I went all out bogeys. Yeah, oh my God. My wife-to-be, she just backed off. She, she was nowhere to be seen. <laughs> I, had, I had the changing of the guards and everything. Everyone was kind of like, oh God, what's going on here? I love that. The photographer was pretending it didn't happen. <laughs> yeah. That was, that was I bet impressive. the Queen loved it because she's got a good sense of humour. No. Well, the, um, Prince Charles... I've got a photo actually, uh, it's of a Prince Charles back, my face, but it looks like I'm about to give him a punch. <laughs> my hand's gone into tone that much. I think it was because I was focusing so hard on trying to curtsy but couldn't curtsy. <laughs> I was like, oh, but it had gone up like this and I was like, oh dear, that doesn't look good at all. I'm surprised there's no guards taking me down. So that was the best and the worst day of your life? No, best. Still the best, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and now we know we need to clean Buckingham Palace a bit better. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so listen, 2020 is coming up. Obviously, another Olympics. Is that something you, you're going to commit to and do? Yes. So I'm aiming Brilliant. for Tokyo. I'm aiming for Tokyo 2020. Fantastic. Obviously, cycling. Um, I, I won't know whether I'm selected for Tokyo until next year sometime anyway. So I just focus on one competition at a time. But again, it's just about having fun. It's enjoying it. It's making it my life. I've also taken up a new sport, Taekwondo, in the hope that maybe that one might get, go somewhere as well. Um, more for my mind, body and soul but also from my memory, because there's a lot of patterns. You have to learn all these punches and kicks. I can't do a high kick for toffee. <laughs> Stay away, so, shall I? You're safe. <laughs> I'm you're okay. safe. Um, but it's just something that I like to do. But alongside that is, you know what? Cycling's great for raising awareness and doing my little bit. But alongside that, I'm also working on my own little projects. So I'm trying to develop working with children in care and uh, special needs and children with disabilities. And obviously, my work with the Stroke Association and different strokes and all these kind of things I'm doing. And it's all just building up the bigger picture. Yeah. And it's all about, for me, it's all about captivating people, educating people and motivating people to do something, to be the best they can be. And that's where that saying, I'm not what happened to me and what I choose to become. Yeah. comes in because we all have choices um, we can choose to have a good day and a bad day or we don't necessarily choose it we have a bad day but we can choose to make it worse or we can make it better um, and sometimes we have a damn right horrible day but then the next day we can change it um, it's about choices so you know what I'm not here to say you know what everyone should become a cyclist you know what it's gonna be brilliant for your mental health it's gonna be brilliant for your physical ability <laughs> everyone can come and race me on the track you don't want that anyway because then they'll <sighs> might beat you uh, I've, got, I've got enough of that going on anyway but you know what even if it's picking up a pen and learning to write again or writing poems or reading learning to read or finding something that you're you a passion of yours or finding something new that was you but or wasn't you but is you now so learning to draw it might be that you had I think there's one thing that can come out of having a stroke or having a disability is that it limits your talent pool and when I say that, I don't mean that in a negative way. So everyone, I believe, has a talent. But you've got to find that talent. Now, when you are, as they call in the sporting world, able-bodied, that talent is very hard to find because you've got so many areas you can go into. But the moment you have, uh, have a, something that's life-threatening or causes a disruption in your life, suddenly that opportunity for talent gets smaller. So you've got more, in theory, you've got more chance of finding that talent. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's, that's my way of reasoning it. And that's, I think, how I came to cycling. Because before I had my stroke, I would never have been a world champion, a Paralympian. Well, for a start, I would have been able-bodied. But beyond that, I would not have been a world champion in any sport. 
this has kind of given me an opportunity and in a weird kind of way it's, it's humbled me it's made me a better person it's made me a stronger person yes i had days where i hate my body and i hate my brain and i hate what life throws at me but ultimately it's given me an opportunity to be a better version of me um find something that i'm good at and do it and also in the process raise awareness and that for me is makes the difference and actually keeps me going on and makes me see the benefits rather than what holds me back. Yeah. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, it really is. You. And you are, you are so inspiring, you're inspiring to everybody. And I think for us what we want to know as well is, you said this at the beginning, that actually it's the first few months of recovery and rehabilitation which are the most important. What advice would you give to people who are going through that? I think, for me, I was obviously very stubborn. I still believe you should be stubborn. Get your money's worth. Um, <laughs> but sometimes you have to take it slow. Like, in the early days of recovery, your brain, no matter what's going on, no matter what the loss is, it's, it's having to work out how to change, how to adapt. And fatigue sets in, and suddenly you're pushing your body through extremes that it can't handle. And actually, that can limit your ability to get better, faster. Um, Accept help, swallow your pride, actually ask for help. Yes, it's hard, don't feel guilty. I think one of the biggest things for me was feeling guilty. Even now, sometimes, like every so often, I get that flutter of guilt that, you know what, I'm putting on Tony that I can't cope today. So uh, there's me having a bad day, I'm irritable, I'm putting it off on her. And then I feel bad when I see the repercussions it gives and how she's coping and having to manage life and how she has to tiptoe around me because of my emotions and fatigue. But don't feel guilty, embrace it and accept it and know that it's going to be a long recovery. It takes a while. If you, if you make it, uh, if you know it's going to be a long recovery, if it comes back sooner, that's a bonus, rather than it being wanting it here and now and it not come back and be a disappointment. Brilliant. Well, you're an inspiring person, and you're beautiful inside and out. You really are, and this is fantastic. Thank you so much and hopefully everybody will agree what a wonderful inspiring woman you are and we've all taken something very special from you, uh, you. this evening so please give her a massive round of applause for Megan. Thank, thank you and also just I want to just take a little bit of time and say thank you to everybody for the Stroke Association because the Stroke Association honestly are an inspiring brilliant association who 23 years ago helped me when my mum passed away and now 20 Three years later, you know, they're inspiring and helping other people. So please give them all a big round of applause, everybody, because they really are amazing. So thank you. Uh, we're going to open it up to some questions. Our international audience, <laughs> Facebook audience, and also obviously people in this room as well. We've got some microphones here, so please do wait until you get the microphone next to you. But we are, what are we doing first? Some Facebook? Oh, potentially we're doing some Facebook. She's going to have to shout. We have to shout. Megan, you're amazing. Oh. Thank you, Fiona. Oh. 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 You guys have been amazing. Um, and then we've got a question from Scott on Twitter, which mm -hmm. says, what words of encouragement do you have for people who, people who are currently in the down part of their recovery? So when someone's in the down part of recovery, what kind of encouragement can you give them? Do you know what? You're going to have down days, and it's going to be hard because you've suddenly got to come to terms with it. I think sometimes it's finding little steps, little goals that can help you move through that. So you know what? I can't do this, but I can do this. It's focusing on what you can do. But one of the things that I did in my early stages just to keep me occupied is I, I made little notes. I say I made little notes. I was really rubbish at it. Um, but they're like little memories of the things that I had achieved over the process of time. And I put them into a bottle. And then on those down days, I'd pull, pull random ones out and I'd see if I could just remember mm -hmm. those down days and remember what it was that I'd achieved and, and keep myself focused. Did that help you? Yeah, it definitely did. It was hard and you've got to get yourself into a routine and the right mindset to do those kind of things. But it just, it also gave me something like moving forwards because I will always remember those times now because yeah. of my memory. I can refer back to those and remember how it was, how my writing looked as well, yeah. which was rubbish. Um, <laughs> shorthand at its finest. Um, Make a great doctor if you don't do the Olympics again. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> but it's, it's hard because you will, and sometimes you get into that real pit of despair where you just don't know how to get out of it. And sometimes it is actually, 
it's getting in contact with people, other people that are, are like you. And I don't mean look like you or like all the things you do, but you can relate to. Um, just for that moment, have a chat with someone else that's having a, either a bad day or actually get yourself to latch onto people that are positive and they can really help pull you up and make you see the positive. But someone that's been through it as well, it just enables you to um, see things in a different light. It just gives you that wake-up call sometimes that you need or just that little bit. It, you can offload as well. It's finding the right people to offload to. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you. Um, we've got a comment from James Green which says, you are absolutely incredible hearing your story and determination to be the best that you can be um, and not being defined by your stroke is amazing. So thank you for sharing. Thank you. Um, thank you. And a second question from Natalie on Facebook, which says, Megan, you mentioned anxiety in your recovery. How do you deal with your mental health? Okay, my mental health is ongoing. So I go through periods of time where I'm absolutely fine. Oh, I think I'm fine. But what happens is you, you learn to cover it up, or you learn to keep doing, or you learn to do something that preoccupies yourself, and suddenly it builds up. Um, and what I find with my mental health is that I, I, it comes in troughs and peaks like this. And I've got OCD as well. And I think... I had it before my stroke, but since the stroke and having memory issues, it's kind of almost made it more aggressive because I need to know where everything is. I need to know that things are here, here, here. As an athlete, I need to have a structured routine. I need to know that I'm not likely to get ill. So it's almost highlighted that a lot more. So first of all, you need to be kind of aware of yourself and how your body reacts and how you are around people. Maybe ask someone, am I acting myself at the moment? Um, if you're not aware, then hopefully that will. It might be that you're in a period of almost you don't want to be aware, you're ignoring it all and you're in self-destruct mode and it's a matter of getting out of that and it takes time. Sometimes it, you know, it can take a while, but it's seeking help, it's getting the therapy you need and actually being actively engaged in that therapy. Sometimes we go and see a counsellor and think this is a load of rubbish, but actually over a period of time you just see how it just comes out a little bit easier. I don't want to tell people what I, what's happening in my life or how I am. It's, it's very personal, it's individual to everyone, but also it's about getting the right person to speak to, the right therapist, the right, the right kind of engagement, because if it's not right for your character, you fight against it, which means you don't actually improve, you don't, and you just feel like it's pointless. You know, I had the wrong physiotherapist. She was a great physiotherapist, I'm sure, but she was the wrong person for me. She told me off like a child. She took me, taught me how to walk to wash my hands and make sure I was able to do something. I splashed her, she told me off. I was like, what? And then I learned, anyway, I got the electric EF, FES system on my hand and I learned how to put the middle finger up. It's covered, guys. <laughs> okay, and I was like, look what I learned what to do. And I, I found that you. highly hilarious. So it's, it's about like, little steps. It's, it's finding the bits that do make you happy. So I've got dogs as well, so I use the dogs. So I've started learning, um, learning how to dog behaviour and therapy and stuff. Um, in the hope that I can become a dog trainer at some point, but more for a hobby than anything When are you going to do that? How can you oh, fit that know. in as well? I'm working on it, I'm working <laughs> on it. We will see. <laughs> um, we've just had a comment from Tony that says, and my beautiful wife-to-be, I'm so, so proud of you. Oh. <laughs> I knew she'd be watching me. <laughs> I'm glad she's watching you. It's good. <laughs> Um, just one last question from Facebook. So this is from Rebecca. Um, it says, if Megan the Now could say one thing to Megan the First, what would it be? What would it be? Do you know what? I'm pro I've probably been asked this and probably said a different answer every time. But I think it would be just accept life as it is, be grateful for what you've got, and build on what you've got. You know, you can... You, Life is precious, and I think that's what, what the, the, the stroke effectively taught me, is that actually life is precious. I could have been dead. And I'm, I'm sure there's a few times where I thought, you know what, well, I wish I was dead. But I don't really mean that. I'm happy, you know. I love life, I love me. Yes, I have, have my uh, downfalls, as we all do. We have our traits. But be grateful for life and, and try and see the positive in everyone. You know, it's really easy to get into that thing of, you know what, you don't your low life and things like that or you don't respect things but actually try and see the positive walking past people rather than thinking you know what they're staring at me because i'm walking funny or my hands gone funny what, what are they thinking about me or when my right side goes and i look like i'm drunk as a skunk probably i'm mm. definitely not um but smile say hello challenge it just 
be the better version that you can be. 2.0. Yeah. Two. Hell Megan yeah. Two. Megan the second. <laughs> Megan the second. And we've got some more questions, have we? I don't bite, honest. You can ask <laughs> me absolutely anything. This one here. <laughs> I, uh, I, uh, and wow, you uh, make a really good woman, really good. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. you do. <laughs> Every single person here exactly. is inspirational. And they've got to remember that is not just me, it's absolutely everyone here makes an impact on someone's life. Yeah. And take that away because they're the bits that keep you going. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Any more? I, I, um, uh, oh, no, no, it's, it's, it's stopped now. <laughs> um, <laughs> I know what you um, understand because I was um, walking out of the pub, which I'd um, uh, soft drink, and r um, round to my car, and the man says, are you going to get that car? in your car? And I says, yeah. He says, you're drunk. <laughs> yeah. I, it's, it's, it's so easy to judge. Yeah. And you've got to be the better person sometimes. Okay. Yeah. Like Tony, my partner, she, she is the first to jump to my defence. And the amount of times we've had people shaking their head or you're in a disabled spot. I've been to the hospital before, got out the car walking, and at the receptionist has said to me, you do know that's a disabled spot and Tony's gone we've got a badge and then I've gone in for whatever I've got to have done come out and I can't walk and suddenly they see the impact it has and people are so quick to judge you know sometimes it's not always visible and sometimes it's visible but not understood and that's where it has to change and how people have to change and have to learn that actually sometimes it's not as black and white and that's what stroke awareness is about it's about trying to tell people that it affects people in so many different ways, whether it's their speech, whether it's their movement, whether it's, a it's so many different things. And I think collectively, all of us together can help move that. And that's what we're hopefully doing today and in the future as well. Uh, I think we're gonna finish now. Uh, and just first of all, say thank you to everybody here. Give yourselves a massive round of applause. You're amazing. And you're so inspiring to all of us. And please, Please give her a huge round of applause to Megan. She is our MBE, she's our everything. Thank you so much and good luck for 2020. Thank you.